we probably don't say nearly enough about our song leaders doing such a great job in picking these songs. When I first started this, the old saying goes, to stand up before folks, I learned to do that a little better and <laughs> broke the ice somewhat of stage fright by leading singing. So I was leading singing before I ever started preaching. And I know what it's like to have to sit down, and not as a duty or a burden, but the responsibility to sit down and pick out songs, keeping in mind what we have sung, uh, the kind of songs that ought to be sung, maybe at various parts or times during the worship. So we appreciate all of those who do our song leading and so grateful for their ability and willingness to use it. Let's never underestimate the importance of singing in worship God. If you would, please turn your Bibles to Jeremiah. That's in the Old Testament, you know. <laughs> Verses 1 through 16. Jeremiah. In a little bit, we'll look at verses 1 through 16. But I am going back to a subject that in going through some of my old notes I ran into back in about 1981. Now, if it was the Jeremiah chapter 7. Did I say 7? What did I say, Jeremiah? Well, you're supposed to know what's on my mind. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 7. I, I was really wondering if you could find... <laughs> I, I was, I, maybe I should have said more about Jeremiah than just that it was in the Old Testament. <laughs> so uh, going to that, we'll get to you in a minute. 1 through 16 is where we'll look in a moment. But I, I was going back through some things and found this. And there's such rich, so many rich studies in the Old Testament. I ought to spend probably a lot more time there than we do because of the value it is and are living the Christian life under the authority of Christ the New Testament. But we will simply call this uh, study, Go Ye Now to Shiloh. We want in this sermon to emphasize the lessons to be learned by going with God to Shiloh. They're valuable lessons that can help all of us serve God. I'll touch on the verses in a moment. I won't just read the whole chapter right now, but when I get to the various verses, we'll look at it because it's 16 verses and it takes a little while to read all of it. Jeremiah, it's called the weeping prophet because he worked in the last days of Jerusalem and Judah. And he is lamenting the fact that God's judgment is being fulfilled upon them because of their persistent rebellion against him in so many ways over so many years. So he was a prophet chosen of God and sent to do his work in the southern kingdom. His was not a pleasant work. I saw one artist's depiction of Jeremiah and it looked like somebody that had uh, had a soured stomach all his life. And if you read Jeremiah and then read the Lamentations, then you would think, well, there's nothing objective about this man. But that was his message, and that was the message God put into his mouth and said, you do not deviate from what I am telling you to say to them. He warned this sinful and stubborn people for a long time before the final siege of Jerusalem came by the Babylonian armies. He, in fact, saw Judah passed from the prosperous conditions under Josiah to the terrible iniquity under the last four wicked kings who reigned over Judah. He experienced, he witnessed firsthand the invasions of the Babylonians and the three invasions that they made, and then it was in the third that they destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And all that time, he, with great courage, he unflinchingly proclaimed God's judgment upon wicked Judah. The people were saying, this is the location of the Lord's house, the temple of the Lord. And the Lord said, because they were saying that, he said this to them, Go ye now to my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. Interesting that at this time, 
that God would say through Jeremiah, go back to an earlier time. We're saying go back to the earlier time of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was saying, go back to an earlier time in the history of Israel to see what I did to that wicked people. We'll develop this as we go through this study. Furthermore, God said, I will do unto this house as I have done to Shiloh. So let us note that Shiloh, God's house at Shiloh, was at the place where God wanted it at that time. And uh, God set His name there. He says, at the first. This house is referred to back over in Joshua chapter 18 and verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh and set up the tabernacle of the congregation there. So it was there, in fact, that Joshua proceeded to draw the lots to divide the land of Canaan among the children of Israel. In Judges 18 and verse 31, we see a reference to the house of God which was in Shiloh. And you may remember, if you're familiar with Old Testament studies and the historical part of the Old Testament, that Elkanah, the father of the great Samuel, went every year to worship in Shiloh, 1 Samuel 1 and verse 8. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 3, there's a reference to the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Now, we need to pause here and make this notation because if you're thinking from your Old Testament knowledge, you're saying, well, the temple wasn't built to Solomon over a hundred years uh, later than the time we're speaking of here. Well, that comes down then to understanding terms as the Holy Spirit used them through the inspired writers. The house of God is called a temple. We have the word temple also in 1 Samuel chapter 1 and verse 9. So it's a matter of how they referenced that place. Not saying a literal temple like Solomon built of rocks, etc., but here was the temple of God in the tabernacle set up at Shiloh. We go now to 1 Samuel chapter 4. Nearly 300 years have gone by since the matters we just read in 1 Samuel regarding Shiloh. If you've read that, you know that the Philistines had made war against Israel. And they had defeated Israel. The elders of Israel decided to take the Ark of the Covenant out of Shiloh. And they thought that if they took it to the very place of battle, that the symbolism of it would save us, they said. Well, you may remember that the Philistines fought. Israel was terribly defeated. There was a great slaughter of Israelites. Some 30,000 footmen fell. The Philistines captured the ark. It was at this time that Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, wicked sons they were, were killed. And you may remember too that when the news came back to Eli as an old man, describes him as very heavy, that when he heard that his sons were killed, he fell backward from where he was sitting and broke his neck when he hit the ground. We also learn that when the wife of Phinehas had the information of the death of her husband and of her father-in-law, and that the ark of God was taken by the Philistines, she also died. And you may remember this, it's a pitiful sight. While she was dying, she named her newborn son, for she died in childbirth. And this is a name you'll recognize, though you may not associate it here. She named him Ichabod, saying, The glory of is departed from Israel. Well, it was evidently at this time when the Philistines were fighting against Israel that God destroyed his house at Shiloh. Now, sometimes you don't realize this, but you can find some interesting references in the psalm about certain of these matters. And in the 78th psalm, we have this. Yet they tempted and provoked the Most High God and kept not his testimonies, but turned back 
and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow, for they provoked him to anger with their high places and moved him to jealousy with their graven images. When God heard this, he was wroth and greatly abhorred Israel, so that he forsook the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent which he placed among men, and delivered his strength into captivity and his glory into the enemy's hand. Psalm 78, 56 through 31. Thus we come down now to the sins of Judah. Because God said, you know what happened back there. You know exactly why I did what I did. It's not something new to you. And as I did to them, so I shall do to you and for the same reason. The sins of Judah, we learn, and now we go to these verses. You can take note of them. First of all, they were given over to idolatry, verses 9 and 18. Then we see that they had actually defiled the house of God, verse 11. Now, of course, they've had the temple for a long time that Solomon built. They simply refused to be obedient to God, verse 28. They were stubborn, verses 24 and 26. They walked in their own counsels, verse 24. They refused to listen to God's messengers, the prophets, verses 25 and 26. They refused to accept the discipline God placed upon them to turn them from their wicked ways, verse 28. They were not properly concerned about the truth of God's will, verse 28. They practiced things which God did not authorize, in fact, he says things which did not come even into my mind. Verse 31. They listened to false teachers who deceived them. Verse 3. And also verse 4. They were hypocritical in their way of thinking, their attitude, in their conduct, and in their worship. Verse number 10. They had some kind of superstitious attitude toward the house of God. Verse number 4. We we'll say more about that in a moment. And they simply refused to repent. Verse 26. There's the reason Judah and Jerusalem fell. God had said, in effect, he's saying, do you think I would do to Shiloh in those days what I did for the reason I did them and not do the same to you? Now, God said to Jeremiah, and I want you to think, you put yourself in his place. And I want you to think about him. God said to Jeremiah, stand in the gate of the Lord's house. Proclaim there in the gate this word. Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Amend your ways and your doings. I will cause you to dwell in this place. Trust ye not in lying words, saying, and here's what they were doing, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. In other words, in their minds, we leave it away we want to. If God put his temple here, nothing happened to us. That's what was going on back there in Shiloh. That's the reason those elders back there in those days said, well, we'll just go take the ark out there to battle and by that very superstitious belief in the ark, then God will help us. We didn't though, did he? Because the ark of the covenant means you have a covenant to keep and I will be with you. Here's what he said that Jeremiah furthermore was to say. If, so it's conditional, you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor, you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. You shed not innocent blood in this place. You walk not after other gods. Here's the conditions. There it is. Then I will cause you to dwell in this place. I will cause you to dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. 
He furthermore says to Jeremiah, you tell them this. You trust in lying words that cannot profit. You come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're delivered to do all these abominations. And then you steal, you murder, you commit adultery, you swear falsely, you burn incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods whom ye know not. Then is this house, which is called by my name, God says, become a den of robbers in your eyes? But go ye now into my place which was in Shiloh, where I set my name at the first, and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. And now, because ye have done all these works, I spake unto you, rising up early and speaking, but ye heard not. I called you, but ye answered not. Therefore, I will do unto this house, which is called by my name, wherein ye trust, and unto the place which I gave to you and to your fathers, as I have done to Shiloh. I will cast you out of my sight, as I have cast out all your brethren, even the whole seed of Ephraim. Now that's the northern kingdom long gone because of the same reasons. And he tells then, the prophet this, Pray not for this people, neither lift up crying a prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. I suggest to you, if you really want to be a faithful gospel preacher, do not stay long away from the prophets. God instructed Judah we might say to straighten up and fly right. In other words, it's in your power to do it. It was your power to leave off what you knew God said. It's your power to change your ways and come back to it. He said, amend your ways. Execute justice with each other. Do not oppress the outsider or the alien. Do not oppress the fatherless of the widows. Do not shed innocent blood. Don't go after other gods. Don't trust in deceptive words. Stop being hypocrites. Quit defiling my house. God said, Jeremiah, they will not listen to you. Do not pray for them. Do not intercede for them. I will destroy the temple. I will cast the people out of my sight. My anger and wrath will be poured out on this place. The Lord has rejected and forsaken the generation of His wrath. I will remove their joy. The land shall become waste. Go ye now to Shiloh. Let us all go to Shiloh. As Paul said of these things, they were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures, and he means the Old Testament scriptures, might have hope. Romans 15 and verse 4. So go with me to Shiloh and let us learn that idolatry is sin. Today we do not have the actual pantheon of the gods they had then, or in the days when the ark was at Shiloh, or in the days of the Greek and Roman gods. What we have today are idols of the things of this world. An idol is anything that comes between you and serving God. So you see, it doesn't have to be some sort of statue in a temple dedicated to the God Big Potato or something like that. It can be anything, and it is, anything that's more important to you than obedience to God. That's your idol. That's all an idol is. And yet, Matthew 12, 29 and 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. In Matthew 4 and verse 10, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve. In John 4 and verse 24, God is spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and truth. And then Jesus said toward the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, But seek ye first, 
the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Go with me to Shiloh and learn that God's attitude toward holy places which abhor wicked people. Upon one occasion, you may well remember, the Lord went into the temple during His ministry on earth, and He cast out all that sold and bought in the temple. He overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold the doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. Matthew 21, 12 and 13. And you may remember that the Lord said to the church of Pergamum in the book of Revelation, one of the churches of Asia, of the seven churches of Asia, listen to what he said to that church. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there some that hold the teachings of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also some that hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans in like manner. Repent, therefore, or else I come to thee quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Revelation 2, 14 through 16. The Lord said to the church, another one of the seven churches of Asia, in Thyatira, But I have this against thee, that thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, who calleth herself a prophetess, and she teacheth and subdueth my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time that she should repent, and she willeth not to repent of her fornication. Behold, I cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of her works. And I will kill her children with death, all the churches shall know that I am he that searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give it to each one of you according to your works. Revelation 2, 20 and 23. Now, do you think God's changed from the time of Shiloh to the time of Jeremiah to write in the last book of the Bible that the apostle of love wrote as Jesus talked about particular churches and the conduct that went on in them? Do we think God has changed his mind as he walks through the churches today and he's changed his standard of right and wrong in Christian conduct? We see also as we go to Shiloh, God's hatred of sin. The world has never understood, and I hate to say it, members of the church don't either, what sin really is in the sight of God. We play with sin, folks. We dibble and dabble with it. We act like it's dealing with some of our spoiled grandchildren. We need to study God's hatred for sin. That's a Bible doctrine. Have you ever done it? And we need to do it as seen, number one, in the price paid for man's redemption from the bondage of sin. And number two, in the light of the sacrifice on the cross of Calvary to make forgiveness of sins possible. God destroyed his own house at Shiloh when his people became so wicked they did not deserve the very symbol of his presence among them. Go with me to Shiloh and see the sin of trusting in lying words. Some were teaching that the fact that the temple was there was all the assurance they needed that God would um, bless them and not destroy Jerusalem. God stressed that these were lying words. These were the words of false doctrine. Paul refers to certain ones who were, according to him, perishing because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And the great apostle continues, And for this cause God sendeth them a working of error, that they should believe a lie, and that they might be judged who believe not the truth, but had pleasure unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 and 11. Go with me to Shiloh and let's learn another lesson. It is the sin of attempting to worship superstitiously. I suggest to you most of the people today that are gathered together to worship are worshiping superstitiously. 
The people were not truly worshiping, but they were superstitious. They, they thought that if they simply cried out, the temple, the temple, the temple, God's temple's here. Everything's all right. We live anywhere you want to, but God's temple's here. After all, I'm a member of the church. I'm a member of the church. I'm a member of the church. God will just automatically give me the stamp that says, go to heaven. When one, as a matter of superstition, involves himself in some religious act or ceremony, he's not worshiping God. We must know whom we worship, and that's God. We must understand that God. How can I do it? As he's revealed himself to me. We must study our duty to God. We must know what the acts of worship are. We must have the faith in God that the word of God can only create in us. Romans 10, 17. And we must act upon that faith. But go with me to Shiloh again. And, and notice the lesson concerning the sin. And, and of course the danger. Of seeking to find spiritual security in the wrong thing. As the wrong person. In the wrong place. In the wrong book. In the wrong religion. We could spend, uh, how long could we spend just on that as you compare and contrast all things round about us religious with the divine volume? But he expects people to take that kind of time and be that interested and that concerned about what they believe, what they practice, where it came from. The attitude they have toward God and His Word. Go with me again to Shiloh and let's learn something about the tremendous wrath of Almighty God. You listen to people nowadays and they preach just some of the Bible, if they preach it at all. They're not going to spend much time on the wrath of God. You even have some of the so-called theologians of years ago saying, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. The God of the New Testament is a God of peace and love, and sweet cooings in your ear. And they forgot that the New Testament presents Jesus as a lamb. It also presents him as a lion. He's both. What we do draws from him the actions of the lamb or the actions of the lion. And when he comes back at the end of time, He'll come as a lion of the tribe of Judah in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who shall punish them with everlasting fire from the presence of the Lord, and that will last forever. And then he says, but when he comes to those who are faithful, he'll come to be glorified in his saints. God is love, but because God is love, he hates sin. God is merciful, but God is filled with wrath. If you can't understand the, your study of the Bible, and I don't know how anybody can really engage in what's called study, real study, and say, well, that contradicts. It does not. Any more than it contradicts the loving parent who's always there to offer the security and the help to the child but also will discipline that child for the child's own good. It's amazing to me what people can see among themselves and they won't let God have any of it. Because they became so wicked, they did not deserve to continue to exist. You know what that tells me? Everything you read about God bringing judgment on ungodly people in the Bible is just saying, folks, that's the way I am and someday all this whole system will cease and I shall bring all people into final judgment. And every secret thing will be brought out. Notice as you go through the Bible rather hurriedly that you have all those people before the flood. They're destroyed because of their wickedness. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed because of wickedness. The Canaanite nations who were in the land of Canaan when Israel came to possess it, God through Israel destroyed them from off the land. The northern kingdom was destroyed for its unfaithfulness. The southern kingdom was destroyed. And God being a just God even destroyed Babylon whom he used to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. 
And though he prepared the whole world to make the Roman Empire the exact time in which the kingdom of heaven should be established, God says in the book of Revelation that he would destroy those who persecuted the church, namely the Romans themselves. And the Bible teaches that very fact, the very fact, and don't let anybody persuade you otherwise, that there is a place that he calls the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And if you'll go back and read in Revelation 21, the kind of people he shows that are going to be in there, and then go see the judgment parables the Lord gave, and you'll see people described just like those people who were there at the time God destroyed Shiloh and the time that he destroyed Jerusalem. We go to Shiloh and we also learn the desperate need, the desperate need, the crying need of genuine biblical repentance. Judah would not hear. Judah would not repent. God, though, commands all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17, verses 30 and 31. God commands His erring children to fully and completely and honestly repent. To Shiloh we go again to learn the ever-present danger of apostasy. I wish you'd go back home when you got a little more time and read and study and consider what is revealed in the beginning of the book of, Ju in the beginning of, the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 2, verses 7 through 14. Judges 2, 7 through 14. All those who lived throughout the days of Joshua and the children of Israel were faithful to God. All those who lived in the time of the elders who outlived Joshua were faithful to God. But it was in the third generation that those people forgot what God had done for Israel and they apostatized. Please get this. We're never more than one generation away from possible apostasy. I would be so bold as to say that we're never more than five years away from possible apostasy. The work we've accomplished today and yesterday mean nothing if we don't accomplish that work every day as long as we're here. We must be steadfast in preaching. We must be steadfast in teaching the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth on every subject and every issue and exposing every false doctrine. And woe be to the people who say, cry not, silence yourself. We've heard enough about that. Leave us alone. We knew that to begin with. Tell us sweet things. Tickle our ears. Don't bother us. If you find that attitude beginning to drift into your mind, you are walking on a precipice, and one step will put you over the edge. Already Satan's having his way with you. You don't even know it. Go with me to Shiloh. And see the sin of false religions. The Bible plainly teaches there's one plan. And only one plan for man's salvation today. The gospel plan. There's many plans of salvation to save you. As there are saviors to save you. When men are one, religious. Number two, zealous. Number three, ignorant of God's plan. Paul describes those people you know in Romans chapter 2 and 3. You know what they do? Just what he tells us they did in Romans chapter 2 and 3. They set up their own religions. It's been in the history of man. It's what they do. We must be careful to point out the difference between the true New Testament plan of salvation and the one New Testament church that Jesus built and purchased with his blood and that all saved people who believe and obey the gospel of the Lord himself adds to that church. And there are no faithful children of God outside of it. I don't care how many people declare to the contrary. The Bible doesn't. And you better go to Shiloh before you start taking some positions that are contrary to the Bible. We don't need the churches of men. We need the churches of our Lord. We need the Lord's church. We need the body of Christ. We need the kingdom of the Lord. All terms referring to the same saved institution. There are so many plans out there, it's best to go to the truth of the Bible and learn what that is, and anything contrary to what's in the Bible, you reject it because it's wrong. Last, go with me to Shiloh. 
and learn the sin of refusing to be governed by the Word of God in every single solitary thing we think, say, and do. You'll remember that this sin is charged against Old Testament Israel. And we go again to the Psalms, Psalm 78 and verse 56. And we note that particular matter. I, I won't take the time to go into all of it now. Because there's so much, it simply says, you must do what I tell you, and the way I tell you, and for the reason I tell you. That may grow old in the mind of some, but you'll never come with anything that tells you how to completely obey God any better than that. As God's people, we are instructed to be governed by His Word, turning either to the right hand or to the left hand. Any kind of deviation from it is sin. We must walk by faith. But faith comes by hearing the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. And to walk by faith is to walk as the Word of God leads you, guides you, and directs you, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Hebrews 11 and verse 6. Well, here are some of the lessons, you may find others, that we learn when we take God's advice that he gave to Jeremiah and told him to stand in that wicked city, Jerusalem, and declare to them their conditions. And he says, go with me to Shiloh. I will do to you what I did to them and for the same reason. Is there any reason to believe he changed? Is there any reason to believe as he looks down on your life, your thinking, your planning, your motives, your desires, your involvement in this world, and think that he judges you on anything different than the New Testament of Jesus Christ? If it is, I'd like to find it out, because Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12 and verse 48. It's no use to study about the love of God if you're not going to study about the wrath of God. If we love God, the proof has always been that we'll keep His commandments. John 14 and verse 15. If we have great faith in God, it will always be formed by the right and divided Word of God because faith comes by hearing the Word of God. Romans 10 17. And upon the teaching of the Bible, then to become a Christian, we will obey His commandment to repent, Acts 17, 30. To confess our faith in the Christ, Romans 10, 10. And then to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ, into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to obtain the remission of sins. That's the Lord's plan of salvation. There is none other. Now, if you would know the great blessings and the peace that comes by giving all, then submit from the heart to that plan of salvation. Romans 6, 3 and 4 and 17 and 18. Rise up from the watery grave of baptism, a new creature, and go forth in the church of the Lord, to which the Lord's added you, Acts 2, 47, faithfully serving Him. And go back and study what happens to those who become unfaithful. And go back to Jeremiah. And go back to Shiloh. And learn from the Word of God how God is and what we must be. If as a child of God you sin, you notice God plainly said, if you'll repent and change your lives, I'll receive you. I'll continue to bless you. But if you're determined to do things your way, if you're determined not to study the Bible, if you're determined to know part of the Bible and that suits you, but the parts you don't like, you don't really pay much attention to, then know you have one that judges you. And it'll be God on the basis of the truth. You need to repent of whatever sin there is as a child of God if you're erring, of course. Come confessing that sin and pray God. We'll pray with you that you be forgiven. Shiloh's given to you now. And what will you profit thereby? Come to Jesus. Do we stand and sing?